Hello and welcome. I'm wondering whether to use the microphone or to use my uh, uh, ex-BBC voice. Uh, I'll probably use the microphone because it might be recorded. Is it working? Good. Hello. Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Misha Glennie. I am the new rector of the Institute. It's a great pleasure to be here on my first day. So, I come to the Institute for Human Sciences and on my first day, I introduce a celebration, a consideration of Charles Taylor uh, to uh, recognize his 90th birthday. It can only go downhill from here. <laughs> um, but uh, really, what a, what a start. I feel deeply, deeply privileged. I was telling Charles earlier on that when I started my first job at uh, New Left Review, New Left Books, um, many, many years ago, the one philosopher who nobody criticized adversely at New Left Review was Charles Taylor. Um, everyone else was game for Perry Anderson and Tariq Ali, but not Charles. And I'm finally meeting him, and uh, not only do I understand why he was not criticized, but I'm also told that at the EVM here, he is the one senior fellow who has come through the doors over the past 40 years, who every single member of staff absolutely adored. And uh, so what a terrific honor it is for me to, um, to recognize him here and to introduce him here and to introduce this evening's panel. With us is also Kelly Anderson, who is the Chargé d'Affaires of the uh, Canadian Embassy here. Welcome to the EVM, Kelly. It's lovely to and lovely to have you here. And above all, Char uh, Charles and Oba here with us. How fantastic is that? Um, before I uh, begin in any detail, let me tell you we've already heard from Andriy Prozorov, uh, who hails from Ukraine, of course, and uh, we'll be looking forward to listening to some more of him. But today is a, a special and it's an, an intimate evening among friends. We have uh, Rajiv uh, Bhagava here with us um, and Hartmut Rosa next to me, long-term intellectual companions of Charles Taylor. The evening is going to be moderated by the wonderful Elizabeth von Taden, uh, who has come from Die Zeit in Hamburg. And uh, she's also a member of the EVM jury for the Milena Yasenska Fellowship, so obviously closely connected with us as well. Um, my special thanks goes to Hartmut um, because he has been uh, critical in initiating and organizing tomorrow's symposium, which uh, will take place uh, throughout the day. And let me also um, uh, uh, mention the participants, all of the participants at tomorrow's sym symposium, and a special thanks to the chair, uh, those people who are going to be chairing the panels, Paolo Costa, Rajiv, I've already mentioned, and Dilip. Is Dilip here? Dilip Gaunka? Yes, there he is over there. Again, close friends and intellectual companions of Charles and friends of the EVM. Uh, thank you very much to our partner, the Max Weber colleague at the University of Erfurt, uh, represented by Bettina Holstein tonight. Is Bettina here? There she is. Bettina, thank you. Um, and a big thank you to everyone from the EVM who has been involved in the organization of this event. Uh, above all else, to my right, Lutke Hagedorn, one of our permanent, permanent fellows, who together with, together with uh, Gesha Kedding, is Gesha here? I think I saw her earlier, there she is, Gesha Kedding, um, planned these two days dedicated to Charles. Lutka's efforts have been typically as indefatigable as they are effective. So thank you very much, Lutka, for all the work you've put in here. 
And uh, above all else, our special thanks to Charles and his wife for taking this long journey from Canada to be here tonight. Um, uh, we are here at the very heart of the EVM, which is uh, the library, surrounded by a, a great legacy of uh, humankind, which uh, I hope, if we ever get more space, we'll be adding to still further over the next few years. That's one of the, one of the things I want to look at uh, in the next um, three or four years while I'm, while I'm here. So, Charles Taylor is a man who needs little introduction. His work is recognized around the world as groundbreaking and he's inspired intellectuals uh, worldwide, awarded the prestigious John W. Kluger Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity by the Library of Congress. Um, his way of uh, posing existential questions that are at the core of our time and our humanity have inspired generations. Charles, your work has touched on the shaping of identities and you yourself have indeed shaped the identity of the EVM in a very profound ways, a profound way with an affiliation that dates back right to the uh, uh, early years, having become an active member of our academic advisory board since the 1980s. On becoming an EVM permanent fellow in 2009, he brought with him a new research focus to the Institute, modes of secular, secularism and religious responses. The focus of the refer research was interdisciplinary in nature and marked a paradigm shift in the understanding of secularization and religion in the modern world. Let me express my personal gratitude for your academic and personal contributions to the EVM, which have influenced so much what the Institute has become today. Let me um, end up by borrowing some of your own words. A couple of years ago you said, I am still on the same issues, <clears throat> but I see much more needs to be done. I would be very pleased to do so, living until 150. There's easily enough work to fill the whole period. If I were to do it myself, I feel that I've just begun to address the real questions. Phew. <laughs> Please allow us to accompany you down this path together to the grand old age of 150, for we are most curious what questions you will be posing next. So thank you very much, Charles, for coming. Thank you all for being here. And now I want to pass on to my distinguished colleague, Elizabeth von Thaden. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michelle Glenny, for your kind words. It seems to be birthday time today, first day of your presence here in the IBM. Welcome. We are all very much looking forward to having you here. 40th birthday of the IWM itself. And of course, most of all, first of all, we're here to celebrate the unbelievable 90th birthday of Charles Taylor. And um, I first of all would like to express my gratitude that you don't leave us alone here, you be us Europeans, in the midst of these dark months we are going through. So it is a special pleasure to have you here in Vienna, in the midst of Europe. There couldn't be a better place to celebrate you and to help, um, to ask you once again for help in understanding the time we are going through. Um, I suppose you didn't choose your 90th birthday to be on the 5th of November last year and you couldn't know what was going to happen. But it is helpful to have you here today and I admit that when I came across the news about the Russian invasion to Ukraine, one of my first thoughts was what would Carl Charles Taylor say? Because this war doesn't really fit with all I've read in your work. And um, so I'm sure you will be open to questions um, tonight regarding the situation we are in and the mess 
we are in. So, nonetheless, nearly just as much as um, nearly ju nearly just as much as I would like to welcome you. Of course, I welcome these two uh, outstanding scholars um, who have both been long-time intellectual companions, both been deeply inspired by Charles Taylor's work, both ready to honor you tonight, Rajiv Bargava and Hartmut Rosa. Rajiv, I would like you to be the first um, to honor Charles. Um, Rajiv Bhargava, near University of Delhi, you all know him, political theorist, founding director of the Parag Institute of Indian Thought, and known for a very good idea, which is Indian secularism, um, which you proposed us as the alternative to the mainstream Western misunderstandings, um, which goes the state must keep its distance from all religious institutions, you say, for the sake of the equally significant values of peace, dignity and liberty. Um, I would be very happy if you started honoring Charles Taylor tonight, focusing on his philosophy uh, of and, and anthropology, his use on practical reasoning, and of course, please do so, the sources of the self, and the secular age. So, please, the floor is yours. <coughs> I think you can as well remain sitting. I think it's fine with the mic. Can you hear me at the back? Right. Okay. So, uh, it's a real, real honor to be here uh, amongst all of you. Uh, congratulations, Misha. Uh, and uh, it's a real, uh, you know, it's terrific to be present here today too celebrate uh, Charles' 90th birthday, uh, and thanks, Elizabeth, for your introduction. Um, Charles and I happened to be together in Oxford in, in the late 1970s. Since I was a mere postgraduate student, and he the most prominent social and political theorist or philosopher at the university, our meeting could only have been accidental. But I believe it was also imminent, perhaps even destined. In the throes of Hegelian Marxism at that time, and I must say that I was, when I first went to Oxford, Misha, I spent all my time not sitting in the Oxford libraries, but hovering up, uh, around 15 Greek Street, where the <laughs> national <laughs> NLB uh, office was. Um, so, uh, so while I was sort of deeply immersed in Hegelian Marxism, I'd begun to read Hegel, completely unmindful of the fact that Charles Taylor had only a couple of years ago written the most influential book in English on the great German philosopher. Yet, the groundwork for the meeting of minds had already been prepared. Moreover, before I arrived in Oxford, I was also an amateur existentialist. By reading secondary literature on existentialism, I had become familiar with Husserl, Heidegger, Sartre, and Merleau-Ponty. For reasons I could not explain then, I was deeply attracted to Merleau-Ponty's philosophy. And at the end of the 1970s, I had accumulated virtually every work of his that was published in English. And these were beautiful books uh, uh, published by Northwestern University. Uh, I don't know, Dalip might remember some of them. A few years later, at a Parisian cafe where we met, I learned that the great French philosopher had a major impact on Taylor's thinking. So one admirer of Merleau-Ponty simply had to seek the other admirer out. With these commonalities, and despite the enormous gap between our respective talent and erudition, an accidental meeting had to turn into a lasting academic relationship. But coincidences do not stop here. Much later, in the mid-90s, when we were already friends, I excitedly told him about Wilfred Cantwell Smith's Modern Islam in India and talked at length about the meaning and end of religion, this very important work of this Canadian uh, theologian and professor of uh, comparative religion. I ended by asking, isn't he the finest historian of comparative religion of his generation, Charles? 
Taylor heard me patiently and then casually informed me that Cantwell Smith, who had taught him at, had taught him at McGill, and he had a huge influence on his own thinking about religion. So I discovered another person whom we both admired. These little anecdotes about figures of common admiration shouldn't mislead you. The fact is that in the intervening period, ideas flowed following the simple principle of gravity, from a much higher plane <laughs> to a lower one, from the master to the pupil, and the latter received them excitedly with much gratitude. This one-sided flow of insights began with his brilliant initial chapters on Hegel that provided the wider cultural and intellectual background to the philosopher's thought. I mean, those were you know, just mind-blowing, that couple of uh, chapters. And from then on, it just continued, greatly helped by his visit in Delhi in 1981, after which we became lifelong friends. His entire work has left a permanent mark on my thinking, as well as on those uh, several friends who are sitting here. And there are good reasons why. For a start, Taylor's range of concerns takes one's breath away. Cutting across specialist boundaries, drawing on multiple philosophical traditions, Taylor has written illuminatingly about a wide spectrum of philosophical topics, moral theory, epistemology, philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, aesthetics, political theory, as well as history of ideas and the history of social and political thought. Legal's, uh, Taylor's legacy in the social sciences is profound. His persistent and quite definitive critique of positivism started way back you know, with his book on the explanation of behavior is accompanied by a careful construal of a philosophical anthropology that underpins his own understanding of social science. For Taylor, human beings are deeply social and historical, self-interpreting, strongly evaluating animals who are at once necessarily embodied, almost always expressive in pre-reflective and reflective media, and prone to ever richer articulations of their own condition. Equally powerful is his impact in moral and political philosophy. Consider his original and creative response to Isaiah Berlin's piece on freedom, where he argues that the real issue before us is not to choose between negative or positive liberty, but rather to articulate a vision of society that embodies a defensible view of freedom as self-realization without falling into totalitarian excesses or his incisive critique of a liberal individualist conception of rights, in which he argues that it fails to acknowledge the broader ethical horizons of a plurality of values which underpin it and with which it must coexist. This critique, among other things, helped him develop his own very distinctive brand of deep pluralism, one suspicious of doctrines driven by a single principle. More importantly, he helped us understand the proper shape of moral reasoning in social and political matters. It is, he suggests, a form of practical reasoning, a reasoning in transitions, which aims to establish not that some position is correct absolutely, but rather that it is superior to some other plausible position within a certain context. And that's, the, that's something which is so important in, when we're reasoning about social and political matters. An even more amazing quality of Taylor is his capacity to change the terms of debate virtually every time he chose to intervene. This can happen only if one is constantly evolving, when, when someone has new things to say to a large number of debates in the academic and public world that one follows keenly and whose mo most significant features one grasps quickly and firmly. Now, this is evident most strikingly in his, in his uh, path-breaking and perhaps his most influential public and uh, recent work, A Secular Age. The debate on secularity and secularism had hitherto focused on whether or not the state is or should be secular. That was secularity one, as he called it. So people argued that the U.S. state was secular, Britain, its establishment is, but not quite, 
Iran for ex is decidedly not. India is differently so. Uh, or uh, the issue was uh, whether or not people in a society have or, be or have or become secular, that is turned away from God, stopped going to church, and whether social institutions and practices make reference to God or to the church. Much of Europe on this, on this uh, standard of secularity too uh, wasn't, uh, was secular, uh, but the UN is far more ambivalent. Uh, they say they are religious, maybe they are more secular than they think, but they certainly don't say that they are secular in this sense. But Taylor, and a lot of people have discussed these two uh, levels of secularity, but Taylor to a trench and to a third deeper sense of secularity, which he calls secularity three, by shifting attention to the conditions of belief. Here is what he has to say. The shift in secularity in this sense consists, among, among other things, of a move from a society where belief in God is unchallenged and indeed unproblematic to one in which it is understood to be one option among others and, fre and frequently not the easiest to embrace. In this meaning, as against sense too, people at least in the North Atlantic world, both the US and Canada and, and the whole of Europe, live in a secular age in the sense that the fundamental framework which people believe uh, or whether people believe in God or not, the fundamental framework has now become what he calls imminent. Even belief in God today occurs within this imminent world. By shifting from secularity in the first two senses and speaking of an imminent framework that provides the background conditions of both belief and unbelief, Taylor has fundamentally altered the way we think about the secular. Yet the subtlety of his thought doesn't stop here. Even the imminent framework is open to two readings, according to Taylor. One closed, the other open. Both visions, he argues, are powerful with deep spiritual roots. But one has faith in God and the other doesn't. He himself leans decided, decidedly towards the open reading, that is to say one that is open to the idea that there is God and that there is faith in God. People who are not religiously musical, and here I do not mean only some secularists, but also many adherents of religion, fail to understand this. In particular, they can't quite get why he is Catholic, why he has, he's, 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 uh, he believes in Catholicism. Because they're convinced that there is only one way of being Catholic, they tend to straight jacket him into a stereotype. Taylor's own Catholicism colors the way he is, lives, acts, and believes, but it does not strongly determine him. He's remarkably open to other religious traditions and particularly to the Buddha. He understands too that profound divergences of religious beliefs and practices coexist with equally profound similarities in faiths. To have a particular faith for him is to be simultaneously open to other faiths, including faith in the human spirit and human reason. Like any deep and complex thinker then, it is hard to pin Taylor down to a single philosophical outlook. He's certainly immune to any categorical classification. He's deeply modern, yet draws upon ancient philosophers, and is acutely conscious of the morally ambiguous legacy of modernity. He's profoundly humanist, yet cannot admit to, submit to the view that, that the source of all that we value lies exclusively in human beings. He's frequently labeled a communitarian thinker, at least at one time he was, and yet it is hard not to think of him as a liberal in the best sense of the term. He's steeped inescapably in Western civilization, but he shows a remarkable readiness to be open to other outlooks and civilizational resources. Taylor is a remarkably subtle thinker, not least because there are few ideas that he completely rejects or for that matter, wholly embraces. He's able to do so because, he, because though he stands on one side, 
He helps us to imagine what it is like to be on the other. Taylor almost always helps us to see from both sides of the fence because he helps us feel the cross pressure of standing in the midst of both. What he says about the pragmatist philosopher William James is equally true of Taylor himself. I don't know if, of anybody else of whom this statement is more true. He may come down on one side, but without, having, but without leaving us bereft of the force of the other side. Commenting on James's view on the struggle between belief and unbelief in modern Western culture, and which Taylor believes is unlikely to end by a decisive victory <clears throat> in favor of one or the other, Taylor says, Taylor says, James is our great philosopher of the cusp. He tells us more than anyone else what it's like to stand in that open space and feel the winds pulling you now here, now there. It needed someone who had been through a searing experience of morbidity and had come out the other side. But it also needed someone of wide sympathy and extraordinary powers of phenomenological description and one who could feel and articulate the continuing standpoint of the open space within, the ambivalence within himself. Now, as I said, this is true not only of William James, but increasingly uh, of the entire philosophical outlook of Taylor, who forces us to catch both horns of a dilemma without fully compelling us to let go of any one. Richard Rorty once remarked that Charles Taylor is the Hegel of our times. This is only partly true. The similarities are there. Like Hegel, Taylor thinks big, connecting disparate things, bringing them together to construct a whole picture. And quite like Hegel, his philosophy is steeped in its own history, evident in his work on the nature of modern identity or secularity. Yes, yet Taylor's thinking departs significantly from Hegel's philosophical approach. For example, unlike Taylor, uh, unlike Hegel, Taylor is not a compulsive systematizer. And quite unlike him, he writes with remarkable lucidity. In direct contrast to Hegel, his philosophical style is genuinely conversational, decidedly and deeply pluralist, and always marked by a lack of you know, finality. Unlike Hegel, Taylor reaches out not only to the specialist, to, to people in his own philosophical circles, but to the wider public. But what separates him most from Hegel, particularly in his work in the last two decades, is his constant attempt to escape Eurocentricity, not by a superficial leaping towards other cultures, but by slowly shrinking the centrality and significance of his own, by putting his own world in its place. Isaiah Berlin once ended a short piece on Taylor by remarking that he's a noble, gifted, and deeply interesting thinker, a man of total intellectual and moral sincerity and unswerving integrity. This could well have been the first sentence of the moral and intellectual assessment of one of the intellectual giants of our time. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv, for this portrait of a liberal Catholic standing in open space, escaping Eurocentrism. Wonderful. I would like to pass the word directly to Hartmut Rosa and ask him for the second statement, the second speech honoring Charles Taylor. Cha Hartmut Rosa um, has an easy job tonight in a way because he comes from Jena. And what should we say about Jena without mentioning that it is still and has always been a heart of the modern self and its sources? 
Hartmut is teaching as a professor of theoretical sociology in Jena and directing the Max Weber colleague in Erfurt, as you have already been told. And I think it is not exaggerated to say that Charles Taylor's life work is a source of your self <laughs> and that your major book about resonance is a kind of answer to the work of Charles Taylor through all these years and decade. Actually, one can easily read your work as the result of a dialogue, a permanent dialogue with Charles Taylor over the years. And um, so we won't be surprised when you will say a word now about Charles' style of doing philosophy mainly the phenomenological side and why it leads with a dialogical mm. principle to the best account principle. But before I leave the word to you, I would like to say a personal word too, because when I was invited by Hartmut to coming to Jena and when I was informed that I was going to share a room with you, Charles Taylor, I couldn't believe what I had heard because since 1997 I'm carrying this piece of yours with me leading a life which I put into my into my on my desk after the birth of my second child because it was so much of a help and it was not only of a help because you were one of the intellectual sources of my intellectual biography because it was simply so warm and inspiring in the existential sense of the word, not in the existential European sense of the word, but in the good sense of the word. And I felt that leading a life might be easier once you had read Charles Taylor. So imagine the woman standing in Jena, being a fellow at Hartmut's colleague and sharing the room with you. So. This was, for me, the embodiment of what the, the good life was meant to be. Thank you for this. Thank you, Hartmut, and I leave the word to you now. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Elisabeth. It's, uh, it's good to hear that the, the making the two of you sharing an office space really worked out very well, right? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, le let me start by saying uh, and by stating how deeply grateful uh, I am for uh, having the chance to be here uh, tonight and for having uh, Charles and Ob and, and all the others here, right? But of course, it's a particular honor to, uh, to yeah, well, to celebrate the birthday uh, with Charles. And I will tell you in a minute why it's such a great, it's a deep joy also for me. I think Elizabeth is quite right. Uh, he, he might be a source of myself. I think you've really become one over the years, but certainly the source of my intellectual uh, thinking. This. But I would also like to thank the uh, Institute for the Wissenschaft... Uh, 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 no, I forgot what it is. Uh, exactly. <laughs> And not just for staging this uh, celebration tonight, right, for all the work uh, and efforts you put in this, but actually also for staging the first encounter I have ever had with uh, Charles Taylor. I'm not sure whether you actually remember it, but I was a, a doctoral student. I had actually already worked for quite some time. I, I did my dissertation on Charles Taylor, right, or which you might have guessed already, right? Uh, it's not that I become. It's not that I turned to Charles Taylor because I was in critical theory or even in social philosophy. It's the other way around, right? Because I came. I will tell you in a minute how this happened. I came across some of your of Charles Taylor's writings and uh, and then I was de decided I wanted to do my dissertation on him so I was looking for someone in Germany who could actually supervise such a, a dissertation and this is how I got to Axel Honneth and only after that I, 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 I turned to critical theory uh, no lens wollen so to speak right um, uh, so um, yeah, at that time, so I was writing my dissertation on you, on you, and I had almost almost I had almost finished it already. At, or at, at, let's say I was two thirds through this uh, work when I finally met you here. I actually once I uh, took a chance to even go to Montreal to McGill, and I thought I would meet you there, but unfortunately you weren't there at that time. So I came home very disappointed. But then finally I met you here, and I remember the uh, the day we. Sp you, it really took a long time. I I couldn't believe how friendly it, it wasn't just that you were. Friendly friendly and nice to me. I think you took me even for lunch. I'm not sure whether it was in this building, but it might well have been. 
but you, but but even there, you it really was a very intense dialogue, right? And I learned a lot from this uh, brief encounter, right? And so I finally uh, wrote my dissertation on you. But let me start by uh, by really telling you how I got to Charles Taylor because I, I started uh, studying in Freiburg. And Freiburg is the Heidegger town, of course. So I studied there philosophy, political science, and uh, German literature. And uh, I started as an undergraduate. And after one and a half years or so, I decided that philosophy definitely wasn't the thing for me. Right? It was so dead, I'd say, right? at least in the way I, I, I learned it uh, there. It just, I would really say, it, it didn't speak to me. Right? It was this. The, the, the books of dead old white men, <laughs> right? And <laughs> and done in a way which uh, just was. I felt some. It's like a dearth, right? It, there there was no Weber would say no color, no magic. It wasn't. There was no breath of life in it. So I decided. Well, if if you want to to really to come across the the you know the secret meanings of life, the really valuable things, then better be a liter uh, in in uh, in literary. Science, right? In studying the, the 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 writers and not the philosophers. But then I had the chance, or I went to the London School of Economics, as still as an undergraduate, and there we had a philosophy course. By uh, pro at that time he wasn't a professor; he was just a lecturer, a Axiotis, a Greek uh, um, scientist, right? Who then. Uh, and, and it was a course on philosophy of social science, and there we read two pieces uh, you had written, and and now you would probably say it's amazing that these two pieces did it, because they are kind of very abstract too. It was uh, interpretation, uh, no self-interpreting, and uh, no inter interpretation of the sciences of man, and and neutrality in political science, and and I really got totally taken by the, by by these two pieces, right? and and I thought this is the way I want to study it, and I wasn't aware why it felt so different. To me, it really, it was a different style of doing thinking. It was a kind of style which I could connect to. And the interesting thing is that my, it, my experience really is that uh, students in, uh, in, in Germany had the same experience. Some of them are here actually, right? We as students and doctoral students. Reading Charles Taylor is different from reading other many of many of the other social scientists or philosophers, and, and now I'm pretty sure. I, I mean, I'm, I know I think I'm, I'm sure it is the phenomenological side of of your thinking and writing, right? It's uh, for for me what Charles Taylor does is really starting from the first person perspective, right? For for me, all of your thinking I would really say is, and uh, you've uh, you've uh, articulated that for yourself in in a, in a number of writings, right? It's the starting point of what what does it mean to be a human being or a human actor in a particular kind of situation? So the question always was, how does it feel, right? And also the question is, what do we do? For example, in these two in, in these two pieces on neutrality and self-interpreting animals, you really ask, what do we do when we try to think on society? Where do we start? Why do we think in that way, right? So it's phenomenology. You already mentioned Merleau-Ponty, right? Which certainly was, I assume, or which I think a, a strong source for you too. But I think the amazing thing is that, of course, you did not, um, for me, you never stopped, and uh, Rajiv just made that point too, you did not stop at the um, at the first person perspective, right? But but then you to kind of, as Rajiv just said, you always asked, could I? I think what you did is giving a third person account of the first person experience, right? It, it, it's a certain experience to be a human actor or to reflect on society, right? And of course, a question that's what Elizabeth said, I think, a, a, the question that always has kind of been pushing you, right, is uh, trying to give the best account of the situation we are in, right? Trying to articulate our experience and our also our hopes and our fears. And uh, then this is how you arrived at those notions of strong evaluation, for example, right? Kind of turning, at, in the first point, turning inward, trying to identify the the driving force in a, in an experience in a sentiment or also in an ac in an action right but then always giving a kind of counter account right could i interpret this experience or this feeling or this evaluation <laughs> In a different way, right? And this is uh, how you. Uh, this is, I think, how you really proceed. You always give different accounts. So your texts are not just kind of accounts of what you experience, but interpret interpretations of that account. Interpretations which always pay. I totally. I, I, I'm totally in sympathy with what Rajiv just said. Uh, always giving counter accounts. I mean, coming from the Max Weber colleague, right? He said for Max Weber. For me, one of the most important principles of Max Weber is that he says. 
äh, what he calls intellektuelle Redlichkeit or intellektuelle Rechtschaffenheit. Always give the highest credit to your opponent's view, so to speak, right? So when I read your text, it's always, I, it seems to me my hunch is to interpret a feeling or a predicament in this way. But some other people might say, say this or that, and then it's a kind of dialogue. And I, I, this is sometimes confusing for students, because they don't really know which of the voices you said in dialogue is Charles Taylor. So when, when I read students' papers, I'm sometimes very confused, because they claim that Charles Taylor claims something, which I think he certainly doesn't claim that, right? And then I look at the text, and then I understand, right? Because he, you are in dialogue with these situations. So I, I think I really was, what I was attracted to in the first place really was this style of thinking and arguing. And that's, that's why I bought all of your arguments, and I still do, <laughs> almost to the present point. You know, when I was, in that time when I did my dissertation, and I think even some time afterwards, whenever I kind of wanted to say something at a conference or a meeting, I always either started by, well, Charles Taylor says, <laughs> Oh, I articulated a thought of myself, and then, and then I ended by, and Charles Taylor says so too, or Charles Taylor would say so too, right? I always thought that this is the proof for the truth of some uh, statement or some insight, right, <laughs> if Charles Taylor says so. And then I, I mean, I then uh, read the, um, I read the legitimation crisis, which, uh, which I still think is one of your, it's one of the most important pieces if you want to understand mo our modern society, our modern predicament, right? And there you really can see the same principle, articula articulating the, d you, you s at one point you write that the kind of the, the, the crack, so to speak, or the rift between a naturalistic, mm, instrumental, rational take of our account of our modern uh, society, of our modern life, um, on the one hand, and, the, and between this perspective and the romantic expressivist perspective, on the other hand, this, the, the gap or the rift goes through every one of us. We can always feel on both sides, right? It's exactly what you said about uh, the secular uh, age stuff. And this is what, what makes it so fascinating, right? Giving both sides and not trying to just make a point. And then combining it, and I have to confess, I mean, it's, it's uh, Elizabeth said, I did uh, at first. I did my I, I did my dissertation where I tried to articulate your philosophical anthropology, and then I came up. Uh, I did the stuff on acceleration actually, and, and, and you were responsible for that too because of this very article leading a life. I think you sent me the manuscript. It was it wasn't published at that point, but there I thought, well, maybe there is something I can add to your thinking from my own side because I thought when my when I think of how I lead my life. It's not always the strong evaluations, right? I, and, and I think that's true for all of you, right? We do so many things which are not motivated by, by our deepest evaluations, but they are motivated by day-to-day -day pressures, by, by our to-do list, by the deadlines and so on, right? So I got into the acceleration business. But afterwards, when I came, the, the, and at X, the acceleration book, I kind of wrote basically, no, no, not completely, but I think at that time, I somehow had to bracket you <laughs> to, to find my own voice, I, I would say. <laughs> Uh, but in the resonance book, of course, I came back. I think it's a very nice interpretation. I like that, right? It's a kind of dialogue, con continuing it with what you do. And in my, in, in the la in the latest book, and this is what I want to st what I kind want want to offer, maybe also for tonight, is, uh, is I came back to to the to something you you uh, you wrote in the latest book. It's a dialogue book. It's a dialogue my, which I did myself with my colleague Andreas Reckwitz, right, on uh, late modernity in crisis, so to speak, spät moderne in der Krise. And, uh, and, and the first parts of this book we, tr we, we used to come up um, with, a, with, a, with articulating how we think social science should be conducted and, and social theory and also sociological theory, right? Because, of, because there are these two sides. I mean, there are people who are in the hermeneutic tradition, right? In the phenomenological tradition like Charles Taylor. And then there, uh, there are those who, d who are either only coming from empirical angles or who just give, I, I would say, third-person um, accounts of so society, trying to analyze society like we would analyze uh, the planets or, or the life of the plants or so, or, or so on. And I think what I learned from you is that what we need is a, is a combination of these two accounts, right? You do need a first-person account of the predicament we are in, be it political or, or, or religious or philosophical or, or otherwise, and then combine it with an analysis done from the third-person uh, perspective, right? From the third-person perspective, uh, looking at our experiences and our motivations and, 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 and our actions in the end. And, uh, and the, uh, the point I think is important is, uh, you said that, uh, you also 
said it in exchanges with um, uh, uh, Richard Rorty and in the book with, uh, with uh, Dreyfus. But the, I think the, the, the most extensive elaboration is in Sources of the Self, where you say what we try to do is giving the best account, the best possible account we can give of our, let's say, of our situation, right? And uh, of uh, as human beings, it depends on what the question is. Of, of democracy, for example, right? What you did with the deliberate Craig uh, Calhoun um, is uh, trying to give the best, the best, gift, giving the best account of the crisis of democracy we have here, right? And if you want to give the best possible account, you have to do it from a phenomenological perspective and from the perspective of a social scientist. And then you put it in dialogue. And I think that's what you always did, right? Putting it in dialogue, not just between the perspectives, but also with people of all sorts, with audiences all over the world. And I think you never shied away also from engaging, of course, in politics and the public and media, where you find, di where, you, where you create dialogue with people from all different sorts of, uh, from, of backgrounds, right? So, so, so for, for me, the task of a social scientist what I think we should do as social philosophers, as social scientists, is trying to give the best possible account of, of existential situations. And I mean, it's no, it's no question, Elizabeth has mentioned it right now, at least in Europe, but probably for all over the world, what we really need is trying to give the best possible account of this terrible situation we are in with the war in the Ukraine, which certainly affects the uh, EVM also um, uh, very deeply. So I hope you'll have a chance to really engage in dialogue and debate tonight. And as I said, it's a wonderful honor. It's a great honor for me and a wonderful occasion. Thanks a lot for being here. And I'm looking forward to our discussions. <laughs>
Thank you. Charles, would you mind joining us now? Welcome on the stage. <laughs> so I'm, I'm <coughs> overwhelmed <laughs> by this, these uh, wonderful statements. Of, uh, it doesn't feel like that from the inside. And why doesn't it? Well, because uh, this business of being a hermeneutical philosopher, a philosopher into this activity of articulating things that we haven't articulated yet. Sorry. I think that the nature of it is, I've tried to argue this in many places, that it never comes to a final conclusion which cannot be further developed and made better by being altered in a certain way. And you know, so. It's uh, so you can't have this feeling, which a lot of the philosophers who taught me had, right? And the, uh, this is goes back to Oxford in the in the fifties. That they had the idea that there are certain things that are just right. I mean, you know, <laughs> Descartes and Locke were just <laughs> right. The information comes in, and we work on it. And that's a very satisfying personally satisfying uh, feeling to have, but I not only very much rebelled against <laughs> their ideas, but, but I would put myself in a situation because I, what I found really helpful in this rebellion was precisely the phenomenological, and I can't stress more Merleau-Ponty, uh, it just hit me, that um, you never can get to that position we figured it all out. That's it, you know? And so, I always think, uh, you know, and later on, somebody's going to come along and say, but you've forgotten this. You know, <laughs> you know I suppose I did really. You know, that's, you know, so, it's, um, it's a kind of uncomfortable position in some ways, but uh, the comfort you get from it is that maybe I've made this little step forward, right? and, and uh, other people will be able to benefit from that. And uh, so the, the debate will go on. So you get your satisfaction from having made these small steps, but you just can never recreate that feeling that, I, you know. Now, is that really true? Am I lying to myself when I say that? Yeah, partly. Uh, partly because <laughs> What I do feel I've left behind me is these methodologies that promise that kind of finality. Right? And uh, of course, when you get to the issue of philosophical <laughs> anthropology, the, the methodologies that do promise that are those that think that the methods of post-Galilean natural science are sufficient to understand human beings totally. And so, I mean, I really think on this issue, <laughs> I think, like my opponents do on every issue, that that really is wrong. I mean, th because precisely there is this dimension of trying to understand what we're doing, what we're aiming at, why we feel this way, why we want to go this way, where you just, you know, you can't get to the final point where it's just right, but you, it's a perpetual search. So, I mean, it follows from all that that the people that have meant a great deal to me as interlocutors are people who are on this kind of search. And as I sit here in this room <laughs> where I've been many times and in many discussions and, you know, for over the years, uh, I feel once more the atmosphere of being in this world, engaged in this dialogue, again, and we've had many, many really interesting ones in this very room. 
It feels a little bit different, though. I mean, it's something. Are there more books? No, but <laughs> somehow I c I'll, ha I'll have to articulate this at some point. I can't quite do it now. But <coughs> so I feel the great, immense uh, gratitude to all the people that I've been uh, dialoguing with, which are here, and and uh, have been in this in this institution that have really said something that pulls me, f uh, you know, in that direction. Uh, I mean, the think particularly, I just uh, talk about Hartmut's contribution, that, you know, th the issue of ethics, the same kind of thing arises there. There are some theorists that think that we can arrive at certainty about certain rules of interhuman uh, behavior and so on. And uh, there are people very much influenced by Kant, their roles, and I think Habermas is a little bit like this too. And, but what they leave out is that in human ethical thinking, it's not just a matter of what we can do to each other or what we owe to each other. There always arises also a question of what human beings are about. What is real human fulfillment? What, what is really a full human life, right? And that's the area where we're never going to get the absolutely final say, but we get tremendously fruitful ideas, like Hartman's notion of resonance, for instance, right? Which, I, you know, I hadn't thought about that in that way before, but I thought that we need this more, more discourse which opens up this set of issues and so on, and, and you know, find in this notion of resonance something that can help that, which you know, hasn't been used up to now. Yeah. And then I have to say about Rajiv, that is very important, our discussions have had a very important influence on, well, my, my political <laughs> action in Quebec, because We've had this tremendous fight in Quebec uh, against a uh, very narrow mode of legislation, which is uh, discriminatory and so on. So the it started off with discussions about secularism, but in India or in up in Kasali, <laughs> they're looking down on uh, the plain and the principles behind uh, that, are, uh, that Rajiv articulated about Indian secularism, the way of putting it, I carried back and then we wrote this report. We had uh, the government was foolish or wise enough to name a sociologist and myself to a commission to look into this issue and we had to redefine laïcité as it is in French, secularism, and we drew on these discussions. So. In a strange way, ideas that were worked out in India begin to be fruitful or be reacted against <laughs> in, in Quebec. <coughs> and all this okay, involves <coughs> newly defining what is a good way of living, in this case, you know, the whole issue of, of how different faiths can coexist in, in society, and the, in this case, the rules for that. Mm. Uh, and there again, we, you know, those of us thinking about this needed these input from other people, other situations, in order to have a richer, I hope, vocabulary. And you know, it will, somebody else will take it up and take it <laughs> further. That I'm sure. But uh, so I want to say how uh, honored I feel and how. Uh, Deeply happy, I feel, to be in this moment here, in this room, in with so many of my interlocutors. And uh, thank you very, very much. <laughs> Please let me come back to a point all the three of you have been stressing now. I mean, there's three eminent um, political citizens and philosophical, uh, f philosophical thinkers sitting next to me here now. And I would like to come back to this 
aspect Hartmut just mentioned and Rajiv did too. What does it mean at present to give the highest credits to your opponent's views? We are in a situation which is nearly uncomparable. Mm. We thought we had left all that behind and now we are back in the history of war and terror, which Agnes Heller in these rooms here has characterized as the typical situation of Europe's history, mm -hmm. terror and war. We are back into that. So please, Charles, just share your ideas with us. What does it mean to find a richer vocabulary, not only to say what we think, where the goods are and the bad ones. Please tell us what does it mean to give the highest credits to your opponent's views now in the new European war? Mm -hmm. And I would like to hear your contributions to the same question yeah. too. Well, I think um, one way of trying to answer this is to take up one of the topics I was mentioning, which is what it is to lead a really full human life. Right? Mm -hmm. What's the, you know, the good life is what they say. In other words, I'm thinking a little bit more in the tradition of Plato and Aristotle than I am of Kant and Bentham and so on, right? And I think something very important has come on the scene in the last, uh, in the 20th and 21st century about this, that, and something that's been very powerfully uh, affected me, is that there is an enrichment of human life which comes from really dialoguing with and understanding very different people, that, you know, actuated by very different uh, deep motivations. That, uh, that itself, that life of exchange itself, is something that greatly enriches you. Right? So uh, now this is also something which is very frightening to some people, right, who feel some deep threat of uh, bits of their identity that they value very much and they feel that very much threatened by this. And it's one of these terrible, politically speaking, it's one of these really difficult issues, how you, you know, I stand on one side of this debate, but I'm not frightened, but on the contrary. And how do you reach out? And that I haven't, uh, you know, if I had the answer to that, <laughs> <what I've laughs> the human race would be, you know, if we had the answer, would be really in a, out of a very difficult situation. But there, uh, um, we can look on this fact as a very potentially positive one, that a great many of the young people today respond to this when you talk about dialoguing with very different people. They really respond to this. If, if I can double back, this is one of the things that Will Smith really taught me, right? That I was doing this honors history degree at McGill and I had to get an elective and I looked around and I saw a comparative religion by Wilfred Campbell Smith and so I'd never heard of him but I took the course and this is extraordinary because he didn't have great rhetoric he wore a gown, which nobody else did at McGill at that point, and he'd walk up and down, and he'd try to create for you what it was to be a Buddhist, what it was to be a Muslim, or you know, particularly Muslim, because he's this field of expertise. And it was just riveting for me. Right? And I began to see how uh, the terribly important part of me and my you know, search in life to be able to make contact with these very, very different spiritualities, right? So, well, I think a lot of people, particularly younger people today, though they wouldn't necessarily articulate it this way, feel that way, that is, very different people, very different ideas, very different spiritual traditions, they want to, not, not necessarily convert to them, they want to understand them, and they feel that they're enriched if they can have this kind of dialogue. And so it, what we at present see in our Western societies is a kind of battle between people who are terribly threatened by these different views, terribly threatened, 
uh, and reacting that way. And the, some pretty terrible demagogues. I mean, there are two kinds. There are people who are too self-absorbed to understand what they're doing, like Trump. And there are people like, I think, nine-tenths of the Republicans in the Senate who do understand what they're doing, but they're willing to sell their souls for <laughs> re-election. Uh, but nevertheless, they want to fight against this, and so they whip up this fear. And <clears throat> they take anyone who's trying to take the other position and, you know, caricature what they're doing as undermining everything that we hold dear, et cetera, et cetera. We have this terrible battle. And the, in the end, see, this is, a, this is a fight about this issue of the rules that should govern our existing together, but it's being partly determined by that other department of ethics, people's understanding of what re really good human life is, right? Because those who understand that in the way I've been describing are going to be all on this side, fighting against discrimination. And those who don't can easily be roped into, recruited <laughs> by the, the other side. Right? So this is, you know, these, these terribly important issues are there. And on one hand, you feel sometimes powerless to affect the uh, outcomes that the, what I consider the good side wins. On the other hand, if you stand back and look at it, there are things moving, particularly in the younger generation, which give you real grounds for, for hope. Right? So, I mean, I'm trying to say it, it's like that this whole issue of trying to understand what a good human life is, is actually tremendously important in its possible political historical consequences, right? And anyway, that's... <clears throat> what about you, Rajiv or Hartmut? You, you were ready to... Sorry, well, just a couple of uh, things. Uh, your question about, and of course this is Charles's methodology in a certain sense, which Hartmut emphasized, <coughs> that dialogue with the opponent by understanding uh, in the best possible way uh, sort of stepping into his shoes and walking with his shoes on for a bit. I mean, I, th I, th I, I look at, you know, at what is happening in India and I imagine uh, sometimes, you know, is it possible for me to talk to my opponents like that? Can I really understand all these people who are lynching others, who are uh, destroying everything around us, every single institution, breaking down rule of law? And is it, uh, can I enter their shoes? And uh, sadly, my answer today is I can't. Uh, but when I think harder, I feel that people like us missed an opportunity earlier. Yeah. There was a time when we could have had a dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time when <laughs> these were others and they were opponents, but they were not mm -hmm. enemies yet. And even if we don't see them as enemies, they see, each, they see us as enemies. And there is nothing we can do to change it. But there was a time, there was a moment of transition when they were not enemies yet. And we could have grabbed the opportunity then and talked to them, but we didn't. So there is always an opening, a hermeneutic opening. And we really need uh, to have the judgment to 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 seize to, to seize it to seize that chance and it's unfortunately it's up to in any dialogue un unfortunately we, we 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 set up 
so we set ourselves up, up uh, ourselves up as equals, but uh, for a variety of reasons, there are some asymmetries, and people who have the, a greater sense, people who have more wisdom, or people who have more sympathy or empathy, you know, they have to take the, they have to take the, they have to grab the opportunity. Mm -hmm. They have to seize the chance. They don't do it; it's gone. And then we have war. Mm -hmm. So, so, and there is no way that we can talk now. Now there is, you know, there's this thinking has its limits. It's not absolute, but there are limits uh, which uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 there's the timing. Timing is very important in this, mm. unfortunately. Uh, we, we would, mm -hmm. And I, after, after that, it just goes. And I think in India, we, we've gone that job. I don't know about Putin and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Ukraine. I mean, maybe, maybe we, we've lost the chance there, too. It seems to me sometimes that you know, there was a chance when we could have done something, and now we are facing this very you know, situation full of possibility of great evil. That we were staring at it, and, and some of us didn't act at the right time. What do you think, Atmut? Does Charles's methodology apply to what we witness at present in the political sphere? Yeah, um, de yeah, I think it definitely does, and I think we. try to make sense uh, out of the situation. I mean, it, it, the situation is very bleak anyway. I mean, it's politically bleak, but it's also philosophically bleak. When, when I listen to, to what, what it, uh, actually to the US case, it looks, does look too, too great, right? But uh, India, you just said we are gone, and we, we are beyond the chance. And I think it's the same, of course it's the same in Europe, I would say. I personally believe that there was a chance in Europe and we blew it, I, I would say. But this is a kind of question of political judgment. So, so I think, I, I would really suggest that we distinguish between the role of politicians and philosophers. I mean, we, we might think in the one way, way or in the others, all of us, right? But it's two different businesses, right? And as politicians, you are now forced to act, right? And, and that's obvious, right? But as a philosopher, I think we should really try to actually apply Charles' methodology. And I think in one sense, you get, I, that's how I would read the situation, you get, we get a strong confirmation of what Charles says. He says, you know, normally in, in our battles, in the political battles of the last couple of years, like are you in favor of vaccination or against it, or for higher wages or lower wages, or I don't know, all, all of these battles we had, a lot of people, I think it did not really affect our strong evaluations, right? It affected a, a lot of our political preferences. But, I mean, that's what you say in Sources of the Self, right? we forgot about strong evaluations. And I think the war does remind us, I mean, it reminds me, I, really, I think I realized that my generation, I myself, was so deeply convinced that we would never have war again, right? That it was so obvious. I'm still a pacifist, I have to say, right? But I think sometimes we have to go, maybe, maybe, maybe we have sometimes to go beyond it politically, but uh, let, let's leave that aside. But what we realize... I think what we can observe is that there are very strong evaluations and they are now violated. And this is why people react so strongly, right? I mean, I think a lot of people have now turned around, right? And they want to go to war or send weapons. That's because our deepest strong evaluations are violated, right? I, I, I think we really see that we do have some, right? The, because it, it really, it, 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 it shakes our foundations. I mean, that's... That's also something you say, right? When, uh, when, when, you, when you kind of hit away the, the deepest, the moral map, so to speak, then you feel utterly lost. And I think that's what, I mean, it feels like this for me, right? So I think, and then something happens which Charles writes a lot, and, and this is, I think it's a, it's a good panel, right, to talk about it. And, and, but then Charles says, okay, when you deal with a conflict there, then at first you only see someone who violates your principles, right? I, philosophically, right? I'm not suggesting we should do this politically because then it gets dangerous. But let's look at it, I mean, okay, let's look at it this way. I mean, we have different uh, uh, possibilities to interpret the situation. One is Putin is just a lunatic. I mean, that might be, that might be somehow consoling, but I'm probably it's not deep enough philosophically. There are other options, right? A second reading is it's just a realist policy. They are, they are the Russians, because it's not Putin alone, right, are just following geostrategical interests 
consciously violating their own strong evaluations. Right? That's possible. Right? That's a possible reading. But the most, the the, the most um, confusing or, or 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 difficult reading would be what Charles suggests. I would say let's test at least whether maybe it's not just someone who is just evil, right? Plain evil. Uh, violating our deepest strong evaluations, but maybe there are other strong evaluations involved which we don't see right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know this is a dangerous reading. I would not say this in a political context. I would get killed anyway, right? So I, I'm not happy that it's always dreamed everything because we lose, we somehow lose spaces where we can think, but as philosophers having a chance of being together, yeah, let, let me finish, right? <laughs> having a chance to try to do this, I think l let's try it, right? So, th so what Charles Taylor suggests is let's test whether maybe there are other strong evaluations, and we would have to carve them out carefully, right, to see them. I, I'm not so sure how we would do this in, a, in the Russian case. I think probably we could also get, uh, interpret it slightly differently and say maybe the Russian war is also about that they are afraid of the strong evaluations which the West stands for because they are danger for their strong evaluations. That's quite possible. But I think it might be too easy for us to simply say, here are our strong evaluations, that's the good, and there are the evils, right? That's not a philosophical reading of the of the situation, even if it's politically adequate. But there might be a, philosoph a philosophical reading which touches the ecological reading in an interesting sense. Um, and Charles Taylor taught me to see in the coal industry, for example, in Poland, something I had never seen before. I had always been, I'm, uh, I'm one of these ecologists, and I'd always been seeing simply the coal industry and the fossil monster which we had to ban and um, escape from. But you taught me actually that one could easily see the pride in doing the coal jobs mm. as a strong evaluation of what really people were committed to. So it is like a teaching in changing the perspective and seeing the political or the ecological sphere with your eyes, which helps to reshape the situation you are in. And I would like to ask you, what did you learn yourself, since you are the one who is searching and questing all the time, so what did you learn yourself in the ecological field when you started to conceive the world a, as a climate disaster, what did you see and how did you reshape your moral maps? Well, I mean, precisely that, because I was aware of the fact, not just in the, you know, the, uh, w the Polish case. Uh, well, it's the Russian case too, well, the it's case. the Chinese case too. But also, I've been talking to, uh, in the German situation, you know, in, that, uh, in, the, in Saxony, there's a, yeah, and what comes clearly from this is that it's not just enough to say, we can give you a job which will pay you as much as you're yeah. now being paid. But that's that whole heroism, the idea of we're going down to the depths of the earth and risking something to do something really important for society, right? So it means that the, the attempt to wean people off that and give them an alternative has to answer this demand, the demand for dignity and importance, mm -hmm. as well as merely mm -hmm. economic demands. Yeah. So somebody who's trying to be effective in this area and is thinking of everything in terms of dollars and cents or you know, in terms of the economic mm -hmm. factors, which is a lot of people in politics mm -hmm. doing that, they're just going to reach a you know, tremendous wall of resistance. Mm -hmm. And so there's, a, you know, there's another kind of, of appeal. And you know, to be... Uh, well, more than fair, I mean, I'm very impressed with the way Biden is trying to sell his uh, buy, uh, Build Back Better, although it's, you know, lamentably being blocked at every point, because he's trying to talk about replacing these ecologically disastrous mm -hmm. modes of employment with others, not just others equally, uh, with equal pay, but something which has know, a great sense of w which you can easily generate here yeah. because the, these alternatives are going to save the planet as well as mm -hmm. giving you a, mm -hmm. a job, right? So, I mean, this kind of insight is directly relevant to, to your politics. I do not know whether we are running out of time, but I don't care, actually. I would... Um, because I, I, have to, I have to ask uh, another, maybe a last question. Um, 
which is closely linked to what we've been saying so far. In I read in in your work, Charles, that there's always a third question, not only the first one, uh, what we should think and how we should live, but what to do about our time. Mm -hmm. So I would very much like to know what does this new European war contribute to reshaping the question what we are going to do with our time. I'm surrounded by students who don't stop asking that question. Mm -hmm. And I would very much like you to answer the question because once upon a time you were a child which was grown up after the Second World War. Mm. And um, so you have a lot of experience we do not have how to deal with wars mm -hmm. um, and how to reshape your life. Um, and to reshape the question uh, of what you're going to do. Yeah, well, maybe a, a good way to start thinking about this is to look at the present war. I mean, because in some ways, I mean, I feel appalled about it for all sorts of reasons and that we all understand, but I also feel ter appalled about it because in some sense it was so unnecessary. So, see, there, there were the makings in the relation between Russia and Ukraine after 91, there was a situation which could have recreated a new kind That's of... That's said, yeah. ...new kind of friendship. Mm. It would have to be equal right, and not, not subordinated, which is what's being proposed now by Putin. And uh, I visited, actually, in 91, uh, Ukraine, and I talked to a lot of people, and the present Ukrainian consciousness wasn't there yet. I mean, there's a lot of Russian speakers particularly in the East, they, you know, they were, didn't know how well they would get on with an estate with the Ukrainian speakers and there was that sort of thing. And, okay, from one point of view, when you look at this, you think it, the Russians are insane. They created Ukrainian nationalism by constantly attacking. Constantly attacking. It, it, and then you think forward, right, now, if Putin doesn't keep total control over information in Russia, his thing will break down because there are people who have relations one place and the other. If it gets through what's going on, uh, you know, the Russophone <laughs> people in, let's say, Kiev or, or, or Kharkiv are being killed. Killed. I mean, the, the supposed reason is that they're being killed by Nazis and they're being actually killed by artillery that we Russians are uh, sending out there. If you allowed some kind of communication here, the thing would break down. And that's why Putin is forced to threaten with 15 years in prison anybody who gets up and says even it's a war <laughs> or it's an invasion. <laughs> level, you know, yet for India, no, 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 it's not. A, it's not a war, and. So you can see here how, uh, in a certain sense, it, it didn't need to be this way unless you had people really captured by a dream that is both <coughs> totally unreal and, in a certain sense, deeply inhuman, right? Because, and it's that dream, the dream of recreating, you know, that Tsar was, had one great title, he was the autocrat of all the Russias, great, little, and white, right? And in that order, <laughs> in that, right? And uh, Putin has this desire to be the, if you like, the kleptocrat of all the Russias, great, little, and white. And this, so there's something so deeply illusion-filled and also very ugly about this, right? So, uh, and you, we are, there's no way out of this humanly without that being somehow defeated, right? Defeated within Russia. <coughs> I mean, it would be best if it could get through to more Russians what's actually going on, but, mm -hmm. but it, you know, it has to be defeated. So there, there are, in other words, there are some uh, understandings of the good life and the good political life which are uh, in some respects, illusion-filled and deeply inhuman, and they don't, you know, they can't be treated on the same footing 
mm-hmm. as the genuine difference between someone who says, well, I'm, you know, I have the makings of a great pianist and that's what I want to do, and somebody else says, I'm you know, a philosopher and that's what I go to. You know, there's no reason to arbitrate between these two, but there are in the <coughs> these other cases, there are things that are so deeply illusion-filled and mm-hmm. but it's a that's not to say <coughs> that it isn't very useful to under, get to understand what this mystique of the Ruski mir is, what it you know, what what it feels like from inside, because it's it's very powerful for those people. And you know, the the Russian Orthodox Church under Kirill is uh, now marginalized in the Orthodox world. They, even the you know the mm-hmm. ecumenical patriarch can't accept that. So there's <coughs> there's a kind of uh, people get into a, this kind of bubble, and of course you see the same kind of bubble, of course, in in uh, people who are worried about the white supremacy in in the West, you know, in mm-hmm. the states and so on. They can't, and so they have a fear-induced notion, and they think the out there they're teaching our kids uh, critical race theory, which is a very refined and complex theory, which you know no one in their right minds would try to teach to kids. They do that in the graduate school, but <coughs> but what they mean is they're telling them about what really went on in American history, and that you know deeply deeply disturbing for them. So there won't be a human solution until some of these bubbles are mm-hmm. broken into. And that would be a kind of doing, breaking these yeah. bubbles. Yeah, yes. and, th- and that's why it's very important not just to say, you know, you're a bunch of idiots and or, or there's not a very good economic policy to mm-hmm. follow and so on. You've got to engage with that and bring people out of it. And, you know, I mean, one of the hopes might be that the the children of these people who are, in, and I'm looking at the North American situation again, the children of these people that are, you know, uh, following this kind of populist xenophobia would convert their parents because it's, it's very clear to me that on the generation that's now, let's say, going through high school and university or the equivalent age, there is much more desire to live in a world of exchange. Uh, I mean, again, let me be very parochial. <laughs> We've made mm-hmm. some some uh, surveys in Quebec about this law number 21, which is wha- what I'm targeting. And people in my age bracket are for it about 75 to 25. People in 18 to 24, are exactly the reverse, 25% for, 75% against, right? Mm-hmm. So there's some kind of hope there, right? That, and why is that? Well, because they're, these people, these kids, are very excited by the cultural life going on outside Quebec, outside Canada altogether, and they have, you know, they have this contact here and that contact there. So there's a hope that you can bring an end to this by showing people in the middle, <laughs> you know, between 30 and 70 or something like that, that this is something that's not going to last. And it's going to do a lot of damage to the society because it's going to divide them. And, they, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, <coughs> and now I'm getting terribly parochial <laughs> with the particular fights that I'm engaged in. But you can see that... Mm-hmm that there's a, a job here to, to get inside, understand, but then in some cases I- I- I explode certain uh, senses of what life is all about, what's really good, and so on. I've ju- just read the news, but when I came here about a group of 15-year-old um, Polish, Russian, Ukrainian, um, boys and girls who traveled to Berlin in order to speak to the politicians and t- to make clear that their point of view yeah. was a different one. Yeah. So um, that is a little bit like um, yeah. Yeah. illustrating I mean what it's you're it's saying. What's mm. really tragic in mm. Russia today is a lot of the younger people are voting with their feet. They're leaving. 
It's a shame. I mean, it, it, it would be better for the world if they... Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to imprison them in that, but it would be better for the world if they went on being there. But precisely that generation is one which is maximally not really you know, on board with this, this really a crazy dream. It's a kind of crazy dream. Of mm. Everybody's going to be happy in this tiered, you know, the great Russians, little Russians, white Russians, <laughs> everyone's going to be beautifully happy in that. Well, th that's that delusion. It would mm. be, you know, the kids don't go for that, but a lot of them are responding by, by mm. leaving, unfortunately. You know. I would very much like to hear your answers too to the question how the um, the experience of a new war is reshaping Charles's question: um, how what to do about our time? Um, Rajiv, please. I have just uh, some couple of thoughts, not on an answer to your question, but just some things provoked by. Uh, first of all, I think this language of you know, uh, insulting language of talking about the other as an idiot. I think that's so counterproductive. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, least, the last thing you need to do to your enemy is to humiliate him. You don't do that. Uh, so I think that's uh, one uh, thing uh, which I find very disconcerting happening today. Uh, the other is the hypocrisy of uh, of the strong evaluators, you know, particularly in the West. Mm -hmm. That's really something which is very upsetting to people who are, who in a sense uh, want to embrace a lot from the West, because the it's. Uh, it's the, 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 the what is said, the rhetoric, and, and what is done mm -hmm. is so, the gap is yeah. so much. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, the, the yeah. you know, people, f the f people are being fooled all the time, and they themselves are taken in by the rhetoric. And if that is happening within these societies, you can imagine what must be happening, you know, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure the intelligent people in these societies understand this. And they have been, I mean, I was reminded of that, Mal uh, an essay by Malaponti where he said exactly that in one of his political essays, in mm -hmm. Sense and Nonsense, or some, you know, one of these books, talk, talking of, you know, how powerful people have to be stopped, they have to stop being hypocritical or else, you know, the world, nobody takes them seriously. From you know what, and and uh, the third is the, the great predicament that we are in today. That those who are thinking and who are willing to understand, they are they have no power, and those who have power are just not willing to think and understand. So uh, the, 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 these are you know if we're talking about systems, right? The 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 kind of the the human knowledge system to which people like us belong. And that's why it's very admirable what Charles has tried to do in the past, mm -hmm. which is, you know, to be in the in a political movement and to stand for political office, to fight against Trudeau, and uh, you know, that's uh, it's r remarkable how somebody can do both these things because most of us uh, are can't even imagine doing something mm. like that. But it's so important because if you do not have power. You can, you know, you do nothing. <laughs> you can't change anything. And the fact is that all those people who have dreams and who have visions of having a better world, and they are all very powerless. Yeah. They are they in the minority. Yeah. And the, there is another minority there. There's no the, the, but another minority there that is brutal in its whole approach to other worlds and to to their own people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is, in the last 20 years, this has become a very big thing. And it's been developing for a long time, fed by 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 huge deal of, you know, capital and all sorts of research institutes being, you know, coming up 
which uh, mm. make this research institute into some little yeah. you know, <laughs> dwarf in, in comparison to those giants funded by the multinationals and by the Koch brothers. And <laughs> I, I don't know how we can deal with this. Uh, we, I just don't know. I mean, oh, we can the, other, the last one we last. Can I mean, the question, the yeah. kick that some people get out of kicking others. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what that is. Bad, strong evaluation or whatever you might call that. Huge Would number of people just want to assert themselves by destroying others. Yeah. And it's so, uh, we, we see it every day, we witness it in India right now. Mm. And I'm sure this must be happening. I mean, I, I, mm. I just dread, uh, I mean, how is it possible for people to allow this to happen? You know, when you see these innocent men and women and young people, old people in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and before that in Syria, and before that in Iraq, Iraq and before that, I mean, it's just the, the list is mm. endless. I mean, there's probably, not a single year uh, when the superpowers have not bombed some country or the other and the result you can mm -hmm. see i mean suffering suffering and but more suffering mm -hmm. we will have to go on discussing this to tonight and tomorrow uh, Hartmut, may i ask you for a short yeah, answer it has question to be short, because I know, but it's uh, but it's really i mean i think it we have to it wind looks up different now. from i mean the, you ask what should we do in this situation i really think the question of course is also what who is the we because it looks very different i mean from what i read for example from india or other places in the global south right they they discover that the europeans are quite hypocritical or so right but uh, which i think is true right but but, but for, for me for example i have to confess it does not just feel like hypocrisy i mean it's really i feel it almost in my stomach uh, the pressure that we should do something and it's some whatever choice you make it seems wrong to me and i think of course charles taylor's work helps us to explain why and it's exactly leading a life where he says it's different strong evaluations right and you cannot say this is the highest and this is the second highest i mean that's how i, I read it right it has to be carefully balanced and sometimes there are predicaments where our deepest convictions g g turn uh, counter each other, and this is exactly what I feel, because the, the one strongest inclination or conviction I always had is that war is wrong. I mean, I, when I was a child, I read every uh, 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 accessible book about war, about Stalingrad, one after the other. It was my deepest experience, I would say, probably deeper than real world experiences. And I drew from this the conclusion that war is always wrong. Dropping bombs on people just is not a solution to any conflict. And this is a conviction shattered now, right? I mean, all of a sudden, Sudden it feels like, yes, this is exactly what we should do. So I think the problem is we have different strong evaluations. Of course, we believe in the right of Ukrainians for self-determination and for, for, the, the, for the people's right of self-determination. And it's a brutal war of aggression. So on the one hand, I would like to drop bombs. On the other hand, I think this is definitely wrong. So what you see is d strong evaluations pointing in different, uh, in different um, uh, directions. And I think there is no easy solution. We cannot say this one is good and the other one is bad. It's important to keep in mind that there is a conflict of the deepest uh, evaluations. Uh, this is why I dislike uh, uh, opinions which say it's very clear, this is the good thing and all the others are just criminals, right? But on the other hand, I think it's very important that we stay true to the strong evaluations, right? Don't give up the idea of self-determination and of, 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 of Ukraine or so on. But it doesn't necessarily mean kill for it. It might actually mean get killed for it if it's necessary. I mean, that would be the solution I, 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 I draw, but I can only take it for myself. You cannot a claim for others to do this, but what I do think, for me, this is really a problem because I think it's just true. We, the Westerners, who have so deep a strong evaluations, just never cared about Yemen, right? I mean, there's a genocide done by Saudi Arabia. We don't have a single sanction against Saudi Arabia. So if war is the bad thing and human rights is the good thing, why don't we have our strong evaluations in that case? And this, I think, is a huge problem, and we have to clarify it probably before we can really uh, mm -hmm. get strong answers. Okay. Let me express my gratitude. Thanks to the three of you. Thanks most of all to Charles Taylor. And the last word, the saxophone from Ukraine. <laughs>